Well, hello. Thanks for joining us at Southeast Missouri Community Church, otherwise known as CMOCC here in Malden, Missouri. Uh, my name is Mark Pickard, and I'm the pastor here at the church, and I get the privilege of sharing some scripture with you today. I want to start by reading the scripture to you, and it's just one verse that I'll share with you real quick, and then uh, I want to expand upon it. But it comes from Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and I guarantee that you've not only heard it before, and many of you have probably used it for it or said it before. It goes like this. In Romans 8, 28, he says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All right, well, that scripture that I just read to you is one that's quoted a lot. In fact, this last week, you know, um, in our household, we've been streaming a lot. You know, obviously, I wish I would have bought stock in Netflix and uh, Disney Plus and, and some of those um, uh, uh, corporations, but I didn't. But either way, on Netflix, I was listening to this lady who was making a very bad decision. And in order to justify the decision, she said, well, I know that God works in all things and he's here present in all things and he's just working for the good of all things. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, that just annoys me to no end. The fact that somebody doesn't have a clue what she's saying, she's just randomly saying something to make herself feel better about the decisions that she's made. And I'm sure that you've heard this scripture before, and there's chances that you've probably uh, even quoted this scripture before. But I want to dissect it for a second. I just want to tear this apart. And I want us to look at what he's really saying here whenever he says these words to us, when he quotes these words to us. First of all, when you look at this, he, he makes a statement. He says, uh, God, uh, we know that in all things, God works for the good. And he says the good of those who love him. Now, the, the question is whether or not God is working for you. And, and I know what's going on. I, I heard a, a, one of my favorite sermons that I, I've heard of. I don't even know if it's really a sermon, just this man talking. His name is Donald Whitney. And he asked the question, he says, how do you know if God is for you or if God is against you? And he goes off and he started listing a lot of things that, you know, if this happens, well, then you feel like God is for you. And if this happens, it feels like God is against you. And I want to go down. Now, this isn't his list. This is my list that I put together for my own people. And it goes like this. So if you get a new job, does that mean that God is for you? But if you lose your job, does that mean that God is against you? If you're healthy, if you're having a good health and you feel good day to day, does that mean that God is for you? But if you get sick, then does that mean that God is against you? If you fall in love and you live a devoted life to one person, the entire life, does that mean that God has been for you the whole time? But if your spouse walks out on you, and wants a divorce, does that mean that God is against you? If your business is flourishing, which many businesses were just up until a few weeks ago, does that mean that God is for you? But if your business is going bankrupt, does that mean that God is against you? Um, if you're young and strong and you feel good, does that mean that God is for you? But what about when you don't feel good and your body's falling apart and you get older and you're dying? Does that mean that God is against you? I'm going to get to the ones that really hit home. Ready? So let's say you get a good, clean bill of health. Does that mean God is for you, but you end up with cancer later down the road? Does that mean that God is against you? What about this? You farmers. What about when the price of grain skyrockets? Does that mean that God is for you? But what about whenever it's dropping, like right now? Does that mean that God is against you? I don't know about you, but it seems like sometimes we tend to decide whether or not at the moment, whether God is for us or against us based upon the circumstances that we're going, for, going through. But the truth is the circumstances don't dictate as to whether or not God is for you. The scripture tells us whether or not God is for you. He tells us straight from the scriptures. He says, those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It's at verse 28. Those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He says that God is for those people who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Now, that word called, okay, we use that a lot in church. You don't hear that a lot other places. I, I hear a lot of teachers talk about being called to the profession. I hear a lot of pastors talking about being called to it. A lot of people call, uh, talk about being called to a ministry. But in this case, we're talking more of an in general call that's going on, a person who's received a call. Now, if you think about a call, it goes two different ways, right? You've got the person who's making the call. You've got the person who's receiving the call. If you're the person making the call, you've actually got to pick up the phone and you've got to dial the number and you've got to send that signal out. But 
in order for that call to be completed, somebody has to pick it up on the other end. Somebody has to answer it and say whether or not they'll accept that call just by picking it up. Uh, We saw this one time in the book of Isaiah. God said, the Lord said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah jumped up and he says, here I am, send me. And he heard the call that God gave him and he went running to that call. Well, it's going to be obvious that that is a person that God is for. Somebody that whenever God says, whom shall I send? He says, send me. That's a person that God is for. When I was a kid, okay, I love telling stories whenever I was a kid. So when I was a kid, my parents decided they want to get rid of me for a week. So they sent me to Boy Scout camp. And I remember getting and driving up to Boy Scout camp, and we got there. And when I first got there, I, it just didn't go well. And I was at Boy Scout camp, and it was a long ways away from mom and dad. And uh, five days feels like a month whenever you're away from your parents or someplace you don't really want to be at the time. And though I was having fun, it just wasn't going the way it wanted, and I got homesick. And I'm going to tell you something. Homesick is one of the worst feelings in the world. And I remember I was homesick. And and this is back in the day of pay phones. For all you people who've got hair like mine, you remember what pay phones were. But either way, so back in the day of pay phones, they had the pay phones that were sitting there. And this other kid told me, he said, look, all you got to do is take 35 cents. You put it in, in the pay phone. He says, and then you tell the lady you want to make a, direct, uh, uh, a collect call. You just tell her the number you want to call, and, and she'll ask if they'll take it, take the charges and pay for it. And, and then you can just call anybody you want. And I said, Psh. Count me in. So I got on that pay phone and, and I walked through it and he told me how to do it. I made a collect call to my mom. And I just, I was just dying to talk to my mom because there's nothing like talking to your parents when you're homesick. I was just dying to talk to mom and dad and just get on the phone and just hear them. And so I called and I remember mom getting on the phone saying, Mark, what are you doing? Why are you making a collect call? And, and mom had to accept the charges in order for me to make that call. You see, a calling is a two-way street. You have to be willing to accept what somebody else is telling you. And in this case, he's talking about the people who are willing to accept it. We call those people Christians. And I don't mean like the whole Christian nation type stuff. That's just phony. There's no such thing as a Christian nation. It's about individual Christians, people who would say that God has called me and I am going to follow him. I'll do whatever he says to do. uh, Peter said this. He says, if you want to be this Christian, He says, you have to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. He says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. He gives you some instructions there. He tells us the type of person. So he says, we got God's putting this call out to you. He says, what type of person or what you're going to do if if you're accepting that call? He says, you will repent and you'll be baptized. Now, repentance, for those guys who don't know, it's a church word. I know it's a church word. Don't don't turn it off real quick. But it's a word that basically means I'm going to stop what I'm doing, and I'm going to do something else. And and one of my mentors always said, he said, it's as if you're going in one direction, and you turn around, and you go the other direction. So if I've got sin in my life, and I'm heading in this direction towards sin, I'm going to stop where I'm at. I'm going to say, Lord, I'm not going to sin anymore. And in fact, you move away from the sin instead of towards the sin anymore. That's what repentance is. You say, God, I'm a sinner, and I don't want to sin anymore. Now, we live in a sinful world. You're going to have temptations. You're going to give in to those temptations. But generally speaking, you're going to fight sin in your life. That's what he means by repentance. You turn away from your sins. But then he goes on, he says, be baptized. Now, let me get something straight. You do not have to be baptized to be saved. Baptism is a way that we tell other people that we are believers of Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is. And I know that we put a lot of emphasis on it. And the emphasis should be that you're telling other people that you're not ashamed to be a Christian. Because when a person stands in front of others, they say, I believe in Jesus. They show where their call is at. And that's what God wants from us. He says that all these people that the Lord will call need to repent and be baptized. And if they will do that, then they will be uh, those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You know, one of the good things about this, and I'm going to tell you, this isn't part of the scripture right here. Uh, it actually comes from verse 30, which is just two, two verses later. He says that these people will also be justified. And justified is another church term, but it basically means it's going to be just as if I had not sinned. 
And he's going to take all those sins that you've had. He's going to forgive you for them. And Jesus is going to take the blame for all the sins that you've committed to turn your back upon God. He's going to take all those sins and he's going to, um, he took the blame from them on the cross for you. And so if you're called, if you're a person who loves him, who's given your life to him, who's repented of your sins, and you've told other people that you've done these things, he says that you are one who loves him and been called with the purpose. So what does that mean for us? So if you're the person that we're talking about, it means that God works for you. Okay? If I go back to that list, whether or not you're, you're healthy or sick, God is for you. Whether or not you're dying or you're just starting life, God is for you. Whether or not you've got cancer or whether or not you're healthy, God is for you. Whether or not the grain prices are horrible or the grain prices are great, God is for you. And it doesn't say that he's just for you, that he's going to make your life great. That's not what he says. He's working all these things, working all these things for the betterment of all people, for the betterment of all of those who love him and are called to that purpose. Now, that purpose that we're talking about, let me get to something first. Don't forget it doesn't mean that life's not going to be a struggle. Life is an absolute struggle, and it's because of the effects of sin on creation. Uh, I, I love to explain it this way. If sin was blue, then everything in our lives would be tainted with blue. If sin was blue, everything in your lives would be tainted with blue. Even the nicest, sweetest things that you do, the most selfless things that you do, they still got a little bit of sin that's involved in them. And that sin is a negative. It's a destructive force. And it, it, you can see what it does to our communities, what it does to our people, and what it does to your own outlook on life. And that's what sin is doing. Romans 8.22 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And that's because of the sin in this world and how it's just basically making the whole world uncomfortable because of it. So then what is God doing? What is God doing if he's working all these things together for the good of all those who love him? What is he doing? I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to take you through an illustration. The other day, my daughter came up and she said, Dad, I want to play Minecraft on the Xbox. And so I'm sitting on the couch and she's sitting on the couch and she's playing with Minecraft. Now, for all of you who, who don't know what Minecraft is, it is a game that kids get on and they take, basically, this guy is a miner and he can go out and he can mine materials and then he can build anything he wants with these materials. And basically, one by one by one blocks and you just set them in different places and you can place glass and you can place metal and you can place wood and you can just build whatever you want. It's a, it's a kid game that a lot of adults play. So it's a good time filler is what it is. But so I was watching my daughter as she was playing Minecraft. And she goes through, and she takes the first block, and she just sets it there. And it was golden. She was using gold. And then next block next to it, next block next to it, next block next to it. She just keeps going around. And each one of those blocks is something that's going on. Just one block. Doesn't mean anything. And I watched her. She went to the next level. And she does the same thing all the way around. And then the next level, and she just keeps building this up. And before long, you can see she's building a house. She's got a roof on it with a pitch. Believe it or not, she actually put a pitch on it. At the top, she put um, uh, uh, windows at the top. So she's got a glass ceiling so she can see the sun as it goes over uh, from her fake little digital world. Uh, and I watched it. She put shrubs on the outside and she put a bed on the inside. She put a door in it. She put windows in it. And then pretty known, some villagers actually came in and they laid in the bed and went to sleep in the bed that she had made. But from each little block, you had no clue what was being done. It wasn't until it was done that you knew what she was up to. It wasn't until she was done with it that you realized that she was trying to build a house the whole time that somebody else could live in that she wasn't even going to live in because obviously it was fake. And sometimes we've got to remember something. We're not always going to get to see the finished product. That you and I are going to go through very hard times. We're going to go through struggles and pains and sufferings. And we're not going to see the finished product, but God has still got a product in mind. He's still building something for us. And it may not be for us. It may be for somebody else. But I'm going to tell you something. No matter what happens, we know for a fact that the finished product is going to be magnificent. I've seen it a few times. A few times. The finished product is being created by the most creative, wonderful, strongest, most powerful, amazing person in history, God. And he's working this all together to, to come up with this product that he's looking forward to having. And he says it will bring glory to him and bring glory to us, the work that we're doing. Now, I said that I've seen it a few times. I have. I've seen it when you have a, a little child accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. And they begin that long life of a relationship with Jesus. I've seen it in the, uh, the, 
the, the man who was on his deathbed except Christ just before he died. Always been a, a deep down believer, just never really got there. You're going to see it in so many different places in our lives. We're going to see it through politicians who are going to accept Christ. We're going to see it through entire communities who will give their lives to Jesus Christ. We're going to see it because one day, whenever we leave this place, we're going to see these people from the pain that you went through, from the, from the, the, the times that you didn't feel like God was with you. You're going to see that God was using what you were going through to bring somebody else to him, uh, to bring glory to him. And I think it's going to be great because one day we're going to stand in heaven and we're going to look around and be like, oh, man, oh, that's what happened whenever I had to deal with that cancer. That's what happened whenever I, you know, my truck broke down on the side of the road. That's what happened whenever, uh, and just go from there. And we've got a big God who's working in all these things. It tells us that for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. He tells us that all of these things that we're going through, all of these problems that you're dealing with, that believe it or not, they're going to change you to be more like Christ. That the amount of blue that's in your life is going to be less and less as you become more like Christ. You know, one thing Jesus tells us that I always like to remember is that he says, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. And that's something we have to remember that once you become a Christian and you've given your life to Jesus Christ, that your life it finally begins to, to be real, that you get to be reborn and you get to start over and you get to have a, a life that you didn't have before. And guys, I'm going to tell you something. If you haven't done that, you need to give your life to Jesus. And for those of you who have, maybe you're not living your life for Christ. Maybe you're not accepting the calling. Maybe you just kind of gotten halfway there, and, and, but you're not really going forward. And so you're not being used as much by God. But I'm going to tell you something, that God can use you if you're willing to be used. He, he loves using people. That's what we've seen so, with all this being said, where do you go from here? If you're not a Christian, give your life to Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, give your life to Jesus Christ and start all over today that you're going to be used by him. And as you go from his point right on, I want to read the scripture to you one more time. It goes like this. We know that in all things, God works for the goal, uh, for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. When you have things that happen in your life, remember something. God is working for the good for the good of those who love him, that your trials, that your troubles may be used for the good. Maybe it'll make you look at him a little bit differently. Maybe it'll make you have a little bit more faith in God that he's right there in the midst of all of it. Let me say a prayer and I'll close it out here. Our Heavenly Father, you're the Lord of lords and the King of kings. I love you. I know that there's a lot of people who are listening to this right now who love you. And I pray, Father, that they would give their lives to you and commit their lives to you. Father, bless the, uh, the remainder of this week and just help us, Lord, to come closer to you through it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, folks, do me a favor. Share this video out to other people so they can get the message. Uh, also, you can follow us on YouTube. You can follow us, uh, obviously, on Facebook. Uh, and if there's anything that you need from us, Southeast Missouri Community Church, you can find us at cmocc.com. Send us a message. Send us a prayer request. Whatever it is that you have, uh, we'll do our best to help you out. Thank you, and God bless you, folks. I love you.